Hi everyone. This is the next lecture in the biogeochemistry section, which is on energetics and how energy flows through ecosystems and how energy drives ecosystems. I'm going to start by talking about the Earth's radiation budget. When we were doing the water cycle, we talked about the water budget, the water balance. Now we're going to be talking about the energy budget and the energy balance. So to understand this, you need to have a good idea of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. Electromagnetic radiation is a form of energy that is all around us, and it's a form of energy that comes in from the sun. I'm sure many people have told you throughout your studies that it's energy from the sun that drives life. So we need to understand this energy that's coming in from the sun and all the different forms that it takes. So the image below here summarizes the electromagnetic radiation spectrum, which includes visible light, but visible light is only a very small proportion of the whole radiation spectrum. On the left-hand side, we have long wave energy, things like radio waves and microwaves, and then also infrared energy, which is important because it can be felt. It's thermal energy, you can feel it. On the right-hand side, we have short wavelength energy, things like ultraviolet light that come in and damage our skin cells if we stay in the sun too long, X-rays and gamma rays. You will remember that we use the Earth's energy budget as an example of an open system because energy can move in from outside the Earth's surface and it can also leave again. So in this image, you can see the energy coming in from the sun that is also being lost back to out of space. But while it's inside the Earth system, that we're interested in how it cycles within the Earth system and what controls how much comes in and what controls how much goes out. So it's a budget. It's all about accounting. Just like you have to balance the amount of money coming in and out of your wallet we have to think about the energy budget. The Earth is a physical system, and into the system there are losses and gains in energy. The inputs are almost entirely solar radiation, so incoming radiation is the one input. Do you remember in the water balance we had one input, which was precipitation and many different ways that the water went out again? It's the same with energy. Solar radiation is the main input to the system, and then the output is outgoing radiation, but this could be many different forms of radiation. It could be reflected solar radiation. It could be radiation emitted from the Earth system and the atmosphere. And it's the net balance that is important. It's roughly in equilibrium, which means the sum of all the incoming radiation is equal to the sum of all the outgoing radiation. And if that's the case, then the Earth's temperature remains constant. However, a budget that is out of balance can cause the temperature of the atmosphere to increase or to decrease and will eventually affect our climate. So if the Earth receives more solar energy than it sends back to space, we expect the Earth to warm. If the Earth sends more energy than it receives from the sun, then we expect the Earth to cool. This is a schematic describing what I mentioned in the slide before in words. And as before, I'm going to go through all the fluxes individually and pull them all together at the end. Energy coming in from the outside comes in as shortwave radiation. So think back to that electromagnetic radiation spectrum. That's high frequency radiation, ultraviolet radiation, also visible light, and there's a little bit of infrared. So it's mostly shortwave. Some of this radiation is reflected off the clouds and goes straight back into space. Some of it is absorbed by the atmosphere and some of it passes through the atmosphere to the Earth's surface. The solar radiation that passes through the atmosphere is either reflected off snow and ice and other surfaces, or it is absorbed by the Earth's surface. We will discuss in future slides what controls how much is absorbed and how much is reflected. But in the meantime, think about what color clothes you would prefer to put on on a hot, sunny summer's day. Now we're going to look at what happens to the energy that is absorbed by the atmosphere and by the Earth's surface. There is some cycling of this energy within the Earth's system, just like there was cycling of nitrogen within the ecosystem in the nitrogen cycle. Let's start at the bottom of the slide, looking at the energy that was absorbed by the land surface. This energy is then emitted from the land surface, but it's emitted as long wave radiation, not as short wave radiation anymore. 
And this long wave radiation has less energy, so it doesn't escape out of the atmosphere as easily as the short wave radiation does. So most of it that is emitted by the Earth's surface is immediately reflected back to the land surface from the atmosphere and absorbed again. So most of the emitted long wave radiation warms the lower atmosphere, which in turn warms our planet's surface. There is a very small amount of the long wave radiation that does radiate out into space. And then some of the radiation that was absorbed by the atmosphere also radiates out into space. So there are some losses, but there's also a lot of this in-system cycling of this energy. All objects are emitting long wave radiation all the time. We just can't see it. We can feel it as heat. The temperature scans that people are taking to test for COVID-19 are measuring our temperature by measuring how much long wave infrared radiation we are emitting. So when someone points a little temperature gun at you to measure your temperature, which is what they do, my partner's been going to consult with some of the health officials in Pretoria and every time he goes to a meeting, they point a little infrared gun at him and measure his skin surface temperature because they want to know if he's symptomatic for COVID-19. What they're measuring is his long wave infrared radiation that he's emitting. And you can make an image of that here, this poor little poodle. His fur is quite cool, you can see, but his mouth and his eyes and his ears are warmer. He's emitting more long wave radiation through his mouth than he is through his fur. So now we understand a little bit more about the fluxes or the arrows in this diagram. We also understand that there are two sorts of radiation that go back to outer space. Short wave radiation, which is reflected off the clouds and the land before it can be absorbed, and long wave radiation that is emitted back after it has been absorbed by the land surface or the atmosphere. In the globe on the left, we see the parts of the world that reflect a lot of solar radiation. So in other words, it never has a chance to enter the Earth and warm up the planet. It comes in and gets reflected back out again immediately. On the right, on the globe on the right, we see the parts of the world that emit a lot of long wave heat radiation. You notice that the places that reflect a lot of solar radiation are either in the poles or in the tropics. So around the middle, the equator or in the very high cold places in the poles. And the inverse pattern is shown with emitted heat radiation. The emitted heat radiation is all in the intermediate subtropics, which is where we live. And you need to think about why that might be. The other thing that you need to look, at, look about, I've been talking about fluxes, and we're measuring these fluxes in watts per meter squared. Now remember I told you in the very first letter, lecture that a flux is a rate, so it's over a unit time. So just remember that a watt is actually a joules per second. So even though we're measuring energy in watts per meter squared, it's still a flux. It's an amount of energy per meter squared per second. Okay, so let's work out this energy budget in actual numbers. About half of the incoming solar radiation is absorbed by the land surface. 48% is absorbed by the land surface. About 30% is reflected immediately back into outer space, and about 20% is absorbed in the atmosphere. Now, what controls how much energy gets absorbed and how much gets reflected? In order to answer that question, I need to introduce you to the concept of albedo. The albedo is a word derived from the Latin albedo, meaning whiteness. So basically, the color and the texture of the land surface is the major control on how much energy gets absorbed and reflected. And we quantify this using a value called albedo. Now, the albedo is really a very simple number. It's the ratio of reflected radiation to incoming radiation. So it's a ratio. It's not measured in any units at all. It's just uh, basically a fraction. If all the radiation that comes in is reflected again, the land surface has an albedo of one, and it is a perfect reflector. If none of the radiation that comes in is reflected again, the land surface has an albedo of zero, and it is a perfect absorber.
Here are some examples of different land surfaces and the typical albedo values that they have. It can range from almost total reflectance, like ice, which is, has an albedo of like 0.8 or 0.9, to almost total absorption. A tar road has an albedo of 0.04, and deep water has an albedo of 0 0.0006. <clears throat> so the albedo of the open ocean is close to zero. So the Earth is made up of all these different land surfaces. So on average, currently, about 30% of the incoming radiation is reflected back out again to space. So the Earth as a whole has an albedo of 0.3. Now that's mostly driven by the amount of cloud and ice that's there. So you can imagine that as the ice caps melt and there is less ice and more open ocean, this value will change dramatically because when the ice caps melt and turn into open ocean, you go from an albedo of 0.8 to an albedo of nearly zero. So when the ice caps melt, the albedo of the Earth will decrease. So the Earth will absorb more radiation. This means the Earth could heat up just because of changes in albedo. Of course, here in Africa, we have no ice and we have no ocean. But albedo changes of different types of land surfaces can also have an impact on our radiation budget. And this is something that land managers are increasingly beginning to realize is an important thing to consider. So within this range of 0.4 to 0 0.25, 0 0.4 being a desert and 0.25 being a green grassy landscape and 0 0.08 being a dark forest, you can see there's quite a lot of range of albedo just on different types of land surfaces, whether it's trees or grass or bare ground. Now, why is that important in Africa? Well, that's because in our tropical and subtropical systems, many of our ecosystems are quite variable in terms of how many trees and how much grass is present. Depending on how many grazers and how much fire we have in the system, the system could switch from being an almost closed canopy of trees to an open landscape of grass. This picture was taken by my colleague Kathleen Smart in the Eastern Cape, showing a patch of land on the left that is the natural succulent thicket of the region, and a patch of land on the right that has been overgrazed by sheep and goats, and most of the woody vegetation has been removed. So this is just a very stark example of how changes in land management can alter the vegetation surface of the globe. This is a really stark contrast if you look at it from the top, from a dark woody thicket to an open light grassland, and it's all caused by differences in how the land is managed. So what is the albedo difference between these two landscapes? So as you would expect, in the open grassy landscape, more of the energy is reflected so this landscape results in a cooler environment than the closed thicket landscape because the budget, the radiation budget is different. You can see that the amount that gets absorbed, the difference between the yellow and the green is less in the open grassy landscape than it is in the closed thicket landscape. Now, people haven't really been thinking about this when they decide how to manage lands. There's been a big push to increase the area under plantation forestry in Africa. So to take our grasslands, and to plant trees. They say this is good for storing carbon because when you plant trees, you store carbon and we need to store carbon. But no one thought that when you plant trees, you're also changing the radiation budget. So you're actually warming the planet by planting trees, which is exactly what you're trying to stop doing by storing carbon. So it's really important to think about these things. All right, so we've talked about the process that controls how much of the incoming radiation is reflected and that's albedo, and about 30% is reflected. Remember, I said the Earth had a radiation and an albedo of about 0.3. Now let's talk about what happens to that radiation that is absorbed. This schematic gives you an idea of the fate of the absorbed energy. So 48% of the incoming solar radiation comes in and to the Earth's surface, and then about half of this energy again, so 25%, is used to drive evaporation. Remember when we had the water cycle lectures, I told you that evaporation takes up heat and cools the land surface. So that energy is being used to drive evaporation. 
And that energy is called latent energy because it is used up by the process of evapotranspiration. Then there's 5% that drives convection, so movement of heat in the atmosphere. And in the end, only 17% of the incoming solar radiation is reflected back as long wave thermal radiation. So only 17% has capacity to heat the planet. I probably should have put this slide at the beginning. It's really explaining to you why this is important. Why are you, why are you here? This is a biology class. This is an ecology class. Why are we talking about energy and physics? It's important for two reasons. Firstly, the incoming radiative energy drives weather and life on Earth. We're going to talk a lot in the next lecture about photosynthesis. So the reason we have life on Earth is because some organisms learned how to capture that energy from the sun and turn it into carbon. And so we need to understand the energy balance to understand life. And then heat transport, movement of this heat energy around the globe, drives weather systems. This little image on the right hand side shows you how it's actually changes in heat energy and movement of heat energy that causes rainfall at big scales in the globe. The third reason why it's important is the greenhouse effect. Because greenhouse gases and other radiatively active gases affect the radiation budget of the Earth, so they affect the temperature of the Earth. Remember I mentioned that within the Earth system there is cycling of energy, and this is caused by the greenhouse effect, where emitted long-wave radiation doesn't escape, but continues to cycle from the atmosphere and back again. So let's talk about that process in more detail. Most gases, especially, especially oxygen and nitrogen, which are the mo main gases in the atmosphere, these gases are transparent to incoming sunlight and also to outgoing long wave radiation. So the energy just moves through them. However, water vapor, carbon dioxide and methane and other trace gases are opaque to many wavelengths of thermal infrared energy. So that means that they can't, that the energy can't go through, especially the long wave energy, the thermal infrared energy is long wave energy and they these gases interfere with the flux of energy. So as that emitted long wave energy goes back from the land surface, the greenhouse gas molecules absorb this long wave radiation and they heat up. Now these molecules heat up and then they radiate heat in all directions. So some of it comes back into contact with the Earth's surface where it is absorbed again. So the temperature of the surface becomes warmer than it would be if it were heated only by direct solar radiation. Now we tend to think of the greenhouse effect as a bad thing, but without the greenhouse effect, the Earth would be a pretty inhospitable place to live, with a mean temperature of minus 15 degrees centigrade. So the greenhouse effect is a natural part of the Earth system that has created life on Earth and has created this planet which is hospitable for life on Earth. It's 30% warmer on Earth than it would be without an atmosphere and without these greenhouse gas molecules reflecting the energy back to the Earth system. So just as with the other cycles we've been talking about, the trouble is not with the greenhouse effect. The trouble comes when we interfere with the system and alter the degree to which the greenhouse gases heat the atmosphere. Thus far in this lecture, we've covered a lot of ground. We've talked about how energy enters and leaves the Earth system and what happens to that energy inside the Earth system and how that affects the temperature of the globe. We've also hinted that the things people do, so anthropogenic activities, can affect this Earth's energy budget. Greenhouse gas emissions can increase the cycling of long wave radiation within the Earth's atmosphere and can warm the planet. This warmer planet can cause the melting of the sea ice, which can result in further warming through affecting the amount of short wave radiation that is reflected. So there's interactions between the long wave radiation and the albedo. And then the third thing we've discussed, which is very important for you to keep in mind, is the changes in how we manage landscapes. So planting trees in places where there were no trees before, or cutting down trees to create open grasslands. Those activities can also alter the albedo. And then because they alter the albedo, they can affect the radiation budget of the Earth. 
This is a slide that summarizes the radiative forcing of various anthropogenic activities since 1750. Radiative forcing is the difference between the insulation, the sunlight, which is absorbed by the Earth, and the energy radiated back into space. The people who created this graph translated all of our impacts that I mentioned just in the previous slide into one common measure, and that measure is the change in overall global energy in watts per meter squared, which is caused by these different impacts. So in one graph, they're able to compare the effects of changing greenhouse gas concentrations to changing the amounts of aerosols or cloud cover to changes in land use. So if you see this graph, you've got a line in the middle, which is zero, which means no radiative forcing. Anything on the right means that the anthropogenic activity has increased the temperature of the Earth. Anything on the left means that the anthropogenic activity has decreased the temperature of the Earth. You can see that since 1750, the major impact we've had has been to increase the radiative forcing due to greenhouse gas emissions because we are burning fossil fuels. We have been increasing the amount of CO2 and methane dramatically, and that has warmed the Earth. However, we have also been decreasing the radiative forcing through decreasing the extent of forest ecosystems. So every time people do deforestation, they're actually cooling the Earth. And also by altering the cloud characteristics. So when we emit all sorts of aerosols and particles and pollution into the atmosphere, we make more cloud and more reflective cloud, and that cools the planet because it increases the albedo. So there are some anthropogenic activities that have had a negative effect on the radiator forcing, but the overall effect is much smaller than the positive effect. The red bars on the bottom give a summary of the net radiator forcing caused by people since 1750. So if you add up all the bars on the right and you minus all the bars on the left, you'll see that in 2011, we've increased the rate of forcing by about 2.3 watts per meter squared. So you need to understand this graph. You need to be able to talk about what radio forcing is, and you need to be able to explain the different impacts that people have on radio forcing via greenhouse gas emissions and via altering the albedo. OK, well done. You've come to the end of quite a complicated and not very biological talk, but I'm hoping when we start the carbon cycle tomorrow, then you'll understand why we need to think about energy in order to understand biology. So by the end of this lecture, there are a couple of things you need to be able to do. You need to be able to describe the energy balance and the different ways that energy moves through systems. So just like before, the inputs and the outputs and the cycling. You need to be able to explain what factors affect how much energy is reflected back out to Earth. So you need to explain albedo and what controls albedo. Then you need to describe how energy from the sun affects both the water and the carbon cycle. So think about that. I didn't really explain it in much detail. You must think about that. It affects the water cycle because remember that it's the energy that drives evapotranspiration, that little flux where 25% of the incoming radiation was actually immediately used to drive evapotranspiration. And the carbon cycle, we'll talk about more tomorrow, but that incoming solar radiation is used to drive photosynthesis. Finally, you need to be able to define radiative forcing, and you need to explain how various anthropogenic activities can affect radiative forcing, and therefore the Earth's energy balance. Great, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture, and I will be back again tomorrow with a very exciting lecture about the carbon cycle. Here are some fun papers if you're interested and you want to do some further reading about these aspects. Um, it's really quite important and quite topical and people are discussing it a lot in the literature, so you might find this useful. <laughs>